Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Zareen Kiran, Assistant Professor uh, in National Institute of Diabetes and Endocrinology from Dow University. And today again, I welcome you all on our another session um, of uh, first online course for the Endocrine Fellows. Um, we have a very good topic to be discussed today. So let's uh, start our program with the Tilawat e Quran. Uh, Dr. Hassan, please uh, uh, كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون الجهيم ثم لترونها عين اليقين ثم شروع اللہ کے نام سے جو نہایت مہربان اور رحیم ہے تم لوگوں کو زیادہ سے زیادہ اور ایک دوسرے سے بڑھ کر دنیا حاصل کرنے کی دھن نے غفلت میں ڈال رکھا ہے یہاں تک کہ اسی فکر میں تم لبے گور تک پہنچ جاتے ہو ہرگز نہیں ان قریب تم کو معلوم ہو جائے گا پھر سن لو کہ ہرگز نہیں ان قریب تم کو معلوم ہو جائے گا ہرگز نہیں اگر تم یقینی علم کی حیثیت سے اس روش کے انجام کو جانتے ہوتے تو تمہارا یہ طرز عمل نہ ہوتا تم دوزخ دیکھ کر رہو گے پھر سن لو تم بالکل یقین کے ساتھ اسے دیکھ لو گے پھر ضرور اس روز تم سے ان نعمتوں کے بارے میں جواب طلبی کی جائے گی صدق اللہ العظیم Jazakallah, Dr. Hassan. Uh, let me again uh, introduce the course and you know, uh, review what we have done so far. Today is the eighth lecture of the 13 lecture series that we have uh, you know, organized and designed for the course. This is a course based on 13 lectures with 13 CME credit hours. And for each lecture, for each credit hour, you have to uh, you know, register individually to ev for every lecture. Make sure you do, do that. Otherwise, the CME credit hours will not be, you know, earned. Um, uh, let me um, also thanks to our professor, Dr. Akhtar Ali Baloch, and my whole faculty from my department for, you know, uh, helping me and, you know, contributing towards organizing this course. Thank, I, do, I do want to thank Barrett and Hodson who, you know, uh, came up with this and with this uh, enlightening opportunity. Uh, we have uh, a very brilliant, enthusiastic, and uh, you know, uh, new endocrinologist. Not very new, but uh, one of the budding ones. Let me introduce her. She is Dr. Uruj Lal Rahman, and she graduated from Army Medical College. Um, and she's a, from the first batch of National University of Science and Technology. And after that, after graduating, she did her internal medicine residency from Pakistan Institute of Medical Sciences, Islamabad. Uh, from then on, she pursued her career in endocrinology and she did her fellowship from Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center under the supervisorship of Professor Tasni Mehsan. Uh, now she's working as assistant professor in technology in, uh, again, Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center. And she's also the supervisor of uh, FCPS Endocrinology Fellowship Program. Welcome, Dr. Rooch, uh, in our course. Uh, we are very thankful that you took out your precious time on a Sunday for our course and contributed wholeheartedly. Um, before I, you know, hand over the mic uh, and the session to you, we are going to first launch the uh, questions, pre-lecture questions, which have been designed by Dr. Roosh. So I'm going to launch the questions. I, I, and I uh, request all the attendees, urge them to kindly participate with your mind 
and uh, do participate actively try to uh, you know uh, question, answer each question so i am launching the pre lecture poll now let's start polling the question because we have little time and we have we want to hear from the lecture uh, what we have learned so far and then then the lecture these questions will be uh, run again after the after the session so first question is 55 year old male who presented with decreased libido for one year he is diabetic for 8 years and he takes metformin 1 gram bd his body weight is 105 kg his testosterone is 6.7 uh the lh is 3.2 the fsh level is 4.1 the prolactin level is 4, 285 and this prolactin level is uh, below the normal range so the cause of this man's low testosterone levels would be you have to opt from one of these five uh, options here and i'm not going to declare the answers you're going to discuss is discuss this later after the lecture is over So number one option is the drug induced hypogonadism. Number two is the non-functioning pituitary adenoma. Number three is the primary testicular failure. Number four is the prolactinoma, and number five is weight-related hypogonadism. So please opt for one of the answers from this question. And I'm now moving on to the next one. Next question is a 19-year-old boy who presented with delayed puberty. his testicular volume is less than 4 cm and the penile length of uh, 5 cm i think the question is incomplete here so let me read it out for you uh, his testosterone is 3.3 uh, nanomoles per liter uh, and his lh is 2.1 fsh is 3.3 and prolactin level is 120 the mri of the pituitary gland is normal so which of the following is the most appropriate test at this point uh, uh narcissa kindly uh, if you can you know um, edit this question again for the post lecture session uh, uh, run this will be easier so the options here is uh, uh 17 hydroxy progesterone level number 2 b b uh, or number 2 is stereotype number 3 is small smell test number 4 is ct scan abdomen and number 5 is ultrasound testes so moving on to the third question a 20 year old female known case of idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism on hormone re replacement therapy for 6 years now she wants to get married and is seeking fertility options so she has uh, so she has come to you she has secondary sexual characteristics and has regular menstrual cycles what is the next step in her treatment uh, so the options here are continue estrogen progesterone and add growth hormone therapy uh continue estrogen progesterone and add hcg continue estrogen progesterone unchanged uh number 4 is increase dose of estrogen and progesterone and number 5 is stop estrogen progesterone and start hcg that is human chorionic gonadotropin now i'm moving on to the fourth question um i can see many of the participants here in the attendees list so i encourage all of them to kindly participate in the poll uh question number 4 is a 2 year old boy was brought due to small penile size along with his mother his birth history was uneventful all the milestones were developed on time so far his right soft testes is in the scrotum while the left one is found in the inguinal canal the stretch penile length was less than 1 cm the fsh is 3 and the lh is 1.2 again the question is bit trimmed here again i think so let me read it testosterone level is 0.1 nanogram per deciliter so what what investigation should be done next to you know uh, go for the diagnosis okay option 1 is mri of the pituitary gland option 2 is the prolactin level option 3 is mri of the abdomen option 4 is the hcg stimulation test and option 5 is insulin tolerance test now i am coming to the last question uh, i wonder if the questions are really hard because only three participants have completed the poll 
Uh, I'm sure many of them are still working on it. So we have very little time. We have taken almost 55 minutes for this. I'm run, uh, reading out the last question. Question number five is a 60 year old male. He's a smoker. He presented with erectile dysfunction, but his libido is fine. He has diabetes and hypertension and is also taking medications. His BMI is 37.8, blood pressure is 140 by 80, and the weight, waist circumference is 110 centimeter. The testosterone level is uh, 12 nanomole per liter, and the hemoglobin A1c is 7.3%. Total cholesterol is 4.5 millimole, and uh, the range shows that it should be less than 5. What is the next step for this patient? What should you do for this patient next? He's come with erectile dysfunction. So option A is arrange cardiovascular assessment. Option B is arrange endocrine workup. Option uh, C is start testosterone. Option D is start phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. And option 5 is commence intravernosal L-prostodol. So almost six minutes, I have read out the questions for you, but I'm sure most of you should have been, you know, reading them themselves. So I think I will just wait for another minute to go for all the participants to participate. Then I'll end the poll. It's okay. We're just taking a few, few more seconds now. 13 participants have completed. There are still more, 14, good. Okay, half minute to go only. Okay, now I'm ending the poll and I'll not share the results. So now I'll hand over the session to Dr. Uruj. Uh, you can now start with the lecture. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Zareen, for the opportunity and for the lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll just share the screen. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Ujlal Rahman. And as Dr. Zareen just said, I'm Assistant Professor of Endocrinology at JPMC. And the topic given to me is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So, a very, very complicated topic, I would say, uh, because uh, to understand, we need to understand the physiology of the reproductive system. Males and females, and then the difference between the two. So I'm going to take you through the physiology. Once you understand it, you will understand the pathology, the clinical features, then we talk about the diagnosis, and this is, this is going to help you the different treatment protocols at different stages which are used. So uh, starting with the lecture. Um, so the reproductive axis is a finely controlled system consisting of three endocrine organs, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the gonads. Hypothalamus, the infantilar nucleus, is the one which has the KNDY and GNRH producing neurons. So it's responsible for the production of GNRH create both the LH and the epithet, and then the gonades, which are responsible for the sex steroids, not only sex steroids, but also the gametes, the sperms and the uh, follicles under the influence of LH and epithet. So this is the um, axis you can see, uh, female, uh, female and male axis. So hypothalamus is releasing GNRH, and GNRH is acting on the anterior pituitary, releasing LH and epithet. In females, it acts on the ovaries, producing estrogen progesterone. In males, 
abuse. Testosterone, which will then have a negative feedback uh, effect. But this negative feedback is not that simple. There are other hormones like inhibin and other factors which are also playing a role in the inhibition, uh, negative feedback, uh, negative feedback to hypothalamus and the pituitary. So what is GnRH? GnRH is the hormone which have which is it is the gonadotropin releasing hormone. So this is the one which is controlling the the the, the LH and FSH release. And uh, it's a DECA peptide. And the important thing about this hormone is that it has it it has a pattern of release. So this pattern of distinct mode of release. So this distinct mode of release is. Uh, is um, selectively confirms that whether LH is going to be secreted from the uh, from the gonadotropes or from or the FSH is going to be released. So it is this. Uh, the, so there are two distinct modes of GnRH secretion: a pulsatile mode and mode and a surge. What happens in the pulsatile? A pulse comes. And in between the pulses, there is nadir levels of GnRH in the, port, uh, the uh, pituitary portal system. While in surge, the pulses are so frequent that it causes a level, a high level in between the pulses. So frequency of the input has been there has a demonstrated to have selective gonadotropin subunit gene transcription. So we know that these LH episodes they have a same alpha unit and it's the beta unit which is different in both. And the gene which is responsible for production of this beta unit is under the influence of GnRH. What about GnRH? The amplitude, the, the rate at which the pulsation is taking place. So if the pulsation is taking place rapidly, like it's more than one pulse per hour, then it will result in production of luteinizing hormone. But if the frequency is um, slow, then it will increase the release of the FSH that is less than one pulse per hour. So what are the gonadotrophs, LH and FSH? These are glycoproteins, which are released from the pituitary gland and they produce, they are responsible for spermatogenesis, folliculogenesis, and ovulation, and in, have, have effect on the gonadal steroids. So testosterone, estrogen, progesterone are also under the influence of these hormones. Then the steroid, gonadal steroids, we have testosterone, it's a primary sex hormone and anabolic steroid in males, it's responsible for the development of male reproductive system, testes and prostate. It is also responsible for secondary sexual characteristics, it increases the muscle and bone mass and growth of the body hair. It is present in females as well, produced from the adrenal gland in a very small quantity. And in both the genders, both the sexes, it's responsible for the health and well being, mood, behavior, and prevention of the osteoporosis. So, estrogen, it, uh, again, it's a female hormone, it's responsible for development of the female sex organs, maintains the secondary sex characteristics. Again, it is responsible, very important for the calcium homeostasis. It also increases the plasma proteins and the corticosteroid globulins, the thyroid binding globulins, and sex hormone binding globulins. So, this has to be kept in mind when we are giving treatment to these patients and estrogen is started or pregnancy takes place and so the different conditions you have to then consider uh, these increased plasma proteins in these conditions. Then decreased, if there is decreased estrogen, what will happen? The loss of bone minerals, the stress fractures, and the postmenopausal osteoporosis and the menopausal symptoms which occur in the females. Progesterone, a very important natural steroid hormone present in much higher concentration in women than in men, responsible for uterine lining and prevents excessive tissue buildup, prevents the excessive overgrowth of the breast tissue, balances blood sugar, metabolism, natural diuretic, normalizes blood clotting, promotes sleep pattern, production of new bone, improves the action of thyroid, reduces anxiety, depression, improves libido. So that's the, all the function which it, it is doing. But the major role is in the pregnancy and it is responsible for the maintenance of pregnancy, especially in the first trimester of the pregnancy plays a main role. So we talked about the negative feedback. So the, the negative feedback is by means of the sex steroids, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. But remember, estrogen has a very complex kind of a negative feedback. It can cause inhibition of the GnRH secretion as well as the stimulation. And that we see in the female menstrual cycle. 
Then inflammation, acute and chronic illnesses, stress, environmental, cortisol, hypoglycemia, drugs, for example, opiates, drugs, stimulating prolactin secretion, metabolism, energy, leptin deficiency, hyperglycemia, so um, obesity, all leading to a inhibitory response. GNIH inhibitory hormone, it has a role on the pituitary as well as on the GNRH neurons. And the sex steroids, again, they have directly affect the pituitary gland as well. So this is how the re development and reproduction, reproductive functions, uh, development of the re and reproductive function takes place under the influence of the different hormones. So what happens during the fetal life? There is a rise in the levels of the GNRH and it uh, in turn is responsible for the development of the differentiation which takes place in the fetal life. Then it goes down. As it, it goes down, the system goes, the, this, this axis goes to sleep. At in neonates around age of one, uh, one to Two, there is a mini puberty uh, uh, if below the age of one and a little bit. There is a mini puberty which takes place because of the pulsation of the GNR. It's in this, we don't know exactly what is the cause of this activation, but it takes place and there's a mini puberty uh, spurt takes place here. Again, then it goes down. And throughout the childhood, it remains, it sleeps, the excess sleeps. Then as the puberty, time of puberty comes, there is increase in the pulsations of this GNRH leading to increase the LH and then the puberty starts taking place and then the levels, they remain higher, pulsations, they keep on there. We're putting the side different, the not only uh, producing the puberty and the changes with secondary uh, sexual characteristic maintaining them, but also the fertility function, the reproductive functions, the like formation of the gametes that takes place. Uh, and it remains at a, 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 it becomes a higher static levels are seen during this time. So what happens in the neurological development? Gonadal differentiation under the influence of various genes like SRY gene, which is specific for males, is followed by the specific, sex specific gonadal hormone production, which evokes the most evident different pathway between the females and males. GNRH neurons, they migrate from the nasal plaquette to forebrain and project neuro, uh, neurosecretory axons to the eminence in the embryonic pituitary. And this at the day 16, and the fetal pituitary gland becomes GNRH responsive and started producing the, the, F, the gonadotropins leading to gonadal steroid production. AMH and testosterone leads to male genital formation. If there is no anti-malarian hormone and there is no testosterone, it will lead to formation of female genital organ by default. So for, the, for, me, for, for, for an embryo to develop into male, it requires testosterone under the influence of the gonadotrophs and the uh, GNRH. And uh, for female, if none of the system is available, then the, the, the by default, the embryo will grow into a female and will have female genital organs. What happens then? It becomes quiescent, except for the mini puberty and, and at a very younger age, then it becomes quiescent. And then at time of puberty, appropriate mutilation of pulse is essential for the pubertal maturation reproductive function. So it requires to puberty to take start, uh, LH pulse frequency a more uh, is required for that. And gonadotropy is triggered, and this is triggered by the release of the gonadotropin releasing hormone, which activates the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So the GNR, it starts functioning, and that in turn reach to the maturation of the axis. Adenarchy is the adrenal androgen production, which leads to the pubic hair and body odor and myelarchy. It's a different process and it occurs, however, it occurs along with it. So gonadotropy, the gonadal growth and puberty taking and secondary sexual characteristics under the gonadal control and adrenarchy, the, the, the hair growth and the body odor, it, the, both the processes, they occur together. So uh, what happens in girls, there is increased weight in estradiol secretion, which causes breast development, which takes place at the age mean age of 10 years and menarche typically follows 2.5 years after the 
onset of the breast development. Average is 12.5, ranging from nine to 16 years. But usually we are, nowadays, we are seeing that this um, age of menarche is more towards the nine rather than towards the 16. A boy's testicular enlargement in volume uh, uh, is the first sign of true puberty and occurs at an average age of 11.5. So this is all um, being done by the pulsati pulsations of the, the uh, hormones in the HP uh, axis. So then what happens at on spermatogenesis? So after as puberty takes place in males, the testes they will start producing the sperms. So at onset, the hypothalamus begins secreting pulses of GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone. In release, in response, the pituitary gland releases the FSH and luteinizing hormone, which enter FSH causes the production, stimulates the sertoli cells, and then produces they, which helps in the nourishment of the sperm cells, and then it begins to produce the spermatogenesis toxicase. LH, when it enters the testes, stimulates the interstitial cells and the lytic cells to produce testosterone, which in turn is responsible for the secondary sexual characters. So very simple. GnRH is there causing LH and FSS secretion, and that's why it's happening. But in case of females, it's a very complicated process. So if menstrual cycle has an early follicular phase, then late follicular phase, then luteal phase, which is a mid, uh, sorry, mid cycle, uh, LH surge, then a luteal phase. And this is all being intricately controlled by the, uh, the axis. So early follicular phase of the men menstrual cycle is because of increase in FSH. Follicular recruitment and maturation takes place in secretion of estradiol in turn, which selectively inhibits the FSH release and maintains a rapid GnRH pulsatility. So, uterine pe inhibition hai, but hypothalamus mein pulsatility estrogen badha hai during the late follicular phase. With this persistent high rapid GnRH, is in turn causes an increase in the LH which also stimulates the further stimulating the E2 secretion and positive E2 feedback results in a mid-cycle LH surge. So LH surge during LH surge, when the LH surge takes place, the GnRH levels consistently elevate because in the pulsation both zyada, so levels to aapke usme hai, portal venous mein hai, uh, uh, portal circulation, ke, uske andar jo levels are consistently elevated. Rahe. So it remains elevated. And then because of this constant elevation, LH starts falling down, suggesting that the frequency of GnRH has become very rapid or continuous, resulting in desensitization of the LH secretion. After evolution, luteinization of the ruptured follicle results in progesterone secretion, which reduces the frequency of GnRH pulse. If corpus luteum demises, there's no fertilization, then E2 progesterone and inhibin levels will fall and GnRH pulse frequency will increase. So very complicated process. And this is what we, when we treat these patients, we have to keep this in mind. And that is how we have to treat them. So, um, so this is how the menstrual cycle is. You can see the pulsations here where the LH surge is taking place. You can see how quick the GnRH pulsations are. And this is leading into the uh, LH surge. And here, because of the excessive pulsation, there is excessive levels of the GnRH, the LH starts going down. So coming to the topic now, I hope it has, you guys have understood a little bit. I hope I have been able to explain. So hypogonadism. So what is hypogonadism? It's a clinical syndrome that results in hormone deficiency in men and women. Primary is hypergonadotropic, also called hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. It's because of the testicular failure. So what is happening? Testicular ovarian failure. So the end organ is not working. So what is pituitary doing? It is secreting a lot of LH and FSH. So it is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism or primary because the end organ is affected. Secondary, when the pituitary is affected or there is other causes. So secondary hypogonadism in which there will be hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So the 
the hormones which are responsible for causing the gonads to work are not coming. And that's why gonads are not working. This is secondary hypogonadism. Uh, so it can be this dysfunction within the hypothalamus or pituitary or some other causes can also be there. Okay. So, um, so causes of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, it can be congenital, isolated gonadotropin deficiencies because of the Kalman syndrome, DAX1 mutation, GBR54 mutation, leptin or leptin receptor mutation, prada willi syndrome, gonadotropin subunit mutation, and idiopathy. So idiopathic is very common. The deficiency of pituitary hormones because of the, the uh, gene mutation, pituitary gene mutations. It can be acquired suppression of the gonadotropins, tropins like hyperprolactinemia, drugs like the steroid administer, gonadal steroid administer, like testosterone, critical illness, chronic systemic illness, diabetes mellitus, and idiopathy. Damage to gonadotropic cells, benign and malignant tumors and cysts, infiltrative diseases, infections, pituitary apoplexy, trauma, surgery, or radiation to cell origin. Here, I have written separately, never forget obesity or metabolic syndrome. It has a very, very important, especially at the time of puberty, it can lead to, especially at, at, at we say, any stage of the, uh, of like, it can lead to the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. In cases of boys, it is uh, the obesity and metabolic syndrome pushes, goes towards the hypogonadism. While in cases of girls, we have seen that obesity leads towards early menarche and early uh, puberty. So um, we have to remember this. We cannot, this has to be remembered because obesity is becoming a pandemic and everyone is nowadays because of the lifestyle having this problem. So clinical features now. Uh, hypogonadotropic. So when at the time of the uh, in the kids and children, what 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 are we going to see? So in, if it occurs, if this hypogonadism during the fetal development is taking place for the first trimester, within first trimester, less than twelve weeks, there will be inadequate differentiation of internal Wolfian ducts and external genitals. So these boys they can present with the range of uh, from ambiguous external genitalia to normal appearing female external genitals. While in second and third trimester, when the growth of testosterone has worked, has formed the external genitals. So at this point, the boys born will have microphalus partially or completely undescended testes. In cases of the girls, uh, with the hypogonadotropic happy, usually present at the time of adolescence with delayed puberty. So what, so as we talked in earlier, the testosterone, in cases of the boys, in, during embryological development, we need the testosterone and we need the uh, hormones for the differentiation of the gonads. But in cases of the girls, it is not needed because if this is not there, by default, the embryo will grow into a girl. So when these girls are born, we, we don't know about the problem until they present at the time of adolescence with delayed puberty. So they have either secondary, absent secondary sexual characteristics or they have amenorrhea. And pre puberty girls will present with signs, and then there can be signs and symptoms of causes of other causes of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, like headaches, visual disturbances, and short stuff. So this is uh, I, I'm, uh, this is a picture of a of a, a boy who had presented in our clinic. So we can see he is uh, overweight. He is a young boy who is uh, um, ten years old, and the complaint was that he was having difficulty in uh, urination and he had a problem with his phallus. So you can see he is overweight. When we examined, he had a burret. This is called a burret penis. So there it is. The small testes you can see, appreciate, and there is buried penis. And when we took it out, we, we pressed it out, it was a micro penis. For this boy age, this shouldn't be this size, it should be uh, bigger. So obesity, I, I wanted, as I said, obesity is one of the causes of hypogonadotropic and in children, it can present like this. So it depends on the severity, uh, how severe it, the, the genetic defects. And so this hall is under, this whole is genetic, uh, the hormonal release is under the gen genetics and it all depends on different genes. A lot of work has been done and a lot of genes have been discovered and it has been seen that in case of severe, there will be cryptococcia or microphyllis 
or in females, primary amenorrhea and absent breast development and in, to the mild. So that's the range of the HH you can see in your patients. So in case of mild, you, you can have partial to complete breast development and oligomenorrhea, and then GnRH induced or spontaneous pregnancy can take place. Testicular volume can be more than six ml. These boys can be fertile eunuch. So they have features of eunuch, but they are fertile as well. Uh, or you can see it with them with delayed puberty or oligosperm. So in case of adult male, what will be the clinical features? If he is prepubertal, so we have, we will see small testes, phallus, and prostate. There will be scant pubic and axillary hair. Disproportionately long arm and legs from delayed epiphyseal closure. Reduced male musculature, gynecomasia, and persistent high-pitched voice. And if this is occurring because of the acquired causes after the puberty, so there will be progressive decrease in muscle mass, increase in visceral fat mass, hypercholesterolemia, loss of libido, importance, oligospermia, or azospermia. Occasionally, menopausal type hot flushes with acute onset of hypogonadism. I want to add over here that in case of prepubertal hypogonadism, the testicular volume is usually less than 15. But in case of postpubertal, once the they have gone through the puberty. So it will, the testes would have shrunken, but the size would be not less than 15 ml. It will be more than, 50, it will be 15 ml, at least 15 ml, and the testes will be soft. So that can help us in differentiating whether it is post pubertal or pre pubertal. In, in, a, in a, the size of the testes can guide us uh, in this. So in case of adult females, they will be presenting with amenorrhea that can be primary amenorrhea, that can be secondary amenorrhea, that can be oligomenorrhea, uh, reduce uh, either no breast development or reduction in size of the breast and loss of libido, bone loss, lethargy, sweating, flushing, and they can present with infertility. So clinical features of we have to look when we, we, we see for hypogonadism, we are, we, are, we are suspecting hypogonadism, then we can look for the features of underlying cause. So Kalman syndrome is one of the common causes of idiopathic. Uh, Kalman syndrome is, sorry, is one of the most common causes. So in which anospia is very common. So you can ask for the smell sensation. And it is because of the defect in the, um, uh, the, uh, the, development so they can be cleft palate and lip and then they can be cerebral ataxia and sensory neural deafness then for pituitary lesions you can ask for headache and visual field defects they can be galactoria if there's prolactinoma or other hormone deficiencies we will look for systemic illnesses can lead to hypogonadotropic hypogonadism the negative feedback suppressing the excess so hepatosplenomegaly in case of hemochromatosis if there's anemia then think of thalassemia sickle cell anemia or celiac disease joint pains like rheumatoid arthritis cuff or shortness of breath and cystic fibrosis or copd acute illness like sepsis, MI, head injury, and then obesity. Don't forget obesity. So this is a picture for Kalman syndrome. They are tall, they're slightly feminized, they have gynecomasia in men, there is female type pubic hair, and there can be frontal baldness is absent in case of then prader willi syndrome we mentioned. So they have narrow temple distance, almond-shaped eyes, thin upper lips and they are overweight. How do you diagnose them? So we do the serum uh, on the levels. Testosterone in case of males will be low in females. Estradiol will be low with LH and FSH, which is inappropriately normal or low. So with this low, LH and FSH, because of the negative feedback, so if there's no testosterone, pituitary should start producing more of LH and FSH. So if it is not producing and if the levels are normal, it means it's not normal means that it is inappropriately normal. It has to rise with the low testosterone or estrogen. So this is telling us that it is hypogonadotropic, hypogonadism, hypogonadotropic, LHFSH low, hypogonadism, testosterone or estrogen low. Then we have to do the dynamic testing. So what are the testing? We can do a serial LH levels, or we can do a CT stimulation test, clomiphene stimulation test, and GnRH stimulation. Yes, these are the three tests we do. In HCG stimulation test, we assess the presence and secretory ability of the testicular tissue. Multiple protocols exist. 
two doses of HCG, 2000 units IM is given on day zero and two, and then testosterone levels are measured on day zero, two, and four. So in prepubertal boys, in which we cannot find the testicular tissue, the raised levels means that there is testicular tissues present. So of course we are giving HCG, it should cause a rise in normal phenomena. You give HCG, the testosterone should rise. So it is rising, it means testicular tissue is present. Failure to response, you're giving HCG and testosterone is not rising. This means there's no functioning tissue. And if there is exaggerated response, so this means the gonads are okay, but they are not get, getting the trigger from the uh, from the pituitary or from the hypothalamus. So when you give the HCG, the testosterone, there will be an exaggerated two, threefold rise in the testosterone levels, which means that there is hypogonadotropic hypothalamus. Again, a clomiphene stimulation test is used for HPT axis for the testosterone. So clomiphene citrate, three milligram per kg, max 20, milligram daily for seven days. And LH FSH is measured at day zero, four, seven, and 10. Two fold in increase in LH and FSH levels is normal, but subnormal response means pituitary or hypothalamic lesions. This is the kind of one. It, uh, so normally it should rise, but in cases of pituitary and hypothalamic lesions, it will not rise. GnRH stimulation test, IV GnRH is given. LH rises three to six fold in 30 to 45 minutes, and FSH rises 20 to 50 percent. In primary testicular fa failure, higher than expected response. Okay, so the testicular karmic pituitary is working, so you give and GnRH, the LH and FSH will rise and it will be ex uh, uh, expected, higher than expected response. Secondary, normal or reduced response. So how to now differentiate whether it is secondary is because of pituitary or hypothalamic, so you, we will give a repeated doses of GnRH. If increased response, then the hypothalamus. So when you give repeated doses and the pituitary, the pituitary starts producing LHFSH, it means that the hypothalamus is not working. And if there is no increased response, then it, meant, it means that pituitary is not working. Okay. So uh, beside this, we need to do investigation for the stru structural integrity. So we look for, we do MRI abdomen. If there is cryptococcidism, when one pedestal is visible, when there's not, then you look for that by doing the ultrasounds or the CT scans or MRs of the abdomen. You have to do ultrasound for the testes, uh, specifically for testes to look at the integrity of the testes. You can, uh, in cases of female, to look for the uh, general female organs, you need to do this in uh, the the, um, uh, the ultrasounds or the MRs. Uh, also, for the underlying cause, you might need to do the MRI of the pituitary if it is pituitary, or, or for the brain to look for the hypothalamic and the pituitary lesions. And the, for hemochromatosis, the iron level and for celiac, the anti-TTG level. So whatever cause you're thinking, you have to evaluate the patient for that as well. Coming to the treatment, so just like the development takes place into steps, there is a neurological development, there is a, um, puberty, there is, uh, there is adulthood, and in adulthood, the important thing is fertility. Treatment is also varies from different stages to different stages. So in male child, if treatment in male child with cryptococcidism and micropenis, so baby is formed and he has cryptococcidism and micropenis, and there is hypogonadotropic you, you know how you treat this patient. So for cryptococcidism, you do orchidopraxy before age one year and you bring it down. And for micropenis, your clinical management of this is very contentious. Uh, some people say you treat, some people say no. Some are uh, sex reversal is also a question which is which has been refuted because there's no clinical, psychological, physical, physiological indication to support conversion of these male infants to girls. So this has been completely refuted. However, testosterone therapy is suggested in, in these boys. And they say one or two short courses of testosterone testosterone therapy in infancy and childhood should augment the penile size into normal range for age in boys with micropenis secondary to fetal testosterone deficiency. Replacement therapy at the age of puberty then results in an adult size penis within 2 SD of the mean. So it helps in at the time of the puberty if, if one or two shots of testosterone is given to these. However, this is like a debate between the pediatric endocrinologists from this, and some of them recommend it and some do not recommend it. 
So treatment, uh, how, uh, the European consensus on this is that in case of the male individual with cryptococcusism with or without micro fitness, you'll, the goal is the testicular descent and penis growth. Cryptococcusism is there then ocoidoplexy before the age of one year. Micro penis, then you can give testosterone, DHT or gonadotropin therapy to the patients between one to six months of age. And you monitor by testicular volume and penile growth. And the monitoring is by testosterone, LH, FSH, inhibin, and AMH levels. So baseline levels of testosterone, LH, and FSH between days 14 to 90 for a later time point. So you need to know the baseline levels of these. And then after this treatment, you have to see these levels. Mayor after GNRH agonist stimulation. And you can also do it after the GNRH agonist stimulation. In case of female, there is no indication for female individuals because the organs are internal. And so there is, uh, till puberty, we don't do any treatment in the female patients. And can, usually female individuals uh, with this disorder usually don't present at childhood, in childhood. And puberty, then we, what we do is androgen replacement therapy in cases of men for fertilization or estrogen progesterone replacement therapy for feminization and breast development, individual development, and cyclical bleeding. Or we can directly give the gonadotropin replacement therapy. So uh, that's uh, the, the, so either this treatment or this treatment. This treatment, the gonadotropin replacement therapy is, a bit tricky. It has, uh, it is very costly and takes time to produce results. But uh, these give results. These are not that costly. Do not give uh, that. Uh, do not uh, is not costly and give results uh, very quickly. So uh, usually the protocol of giving androgen replacement or estrogen progesterone for puberty is followed. Rather, the, this is not usually followed. But it can be, and it has it should be discussed with the patients. So oh, I'm sorry, it's not that clear. But in case of induction of puberty in boys, we can give uh, testosterone initial dose 50 milligram IM monthly, and then increasing the dose by every six to 12 months up to 250 milligram per month. And why are we giving smaller dose and uh, taking it up? Because testosterone has this tendency of aggression and behavior changes. So uh, to make it easy for the patient and its family, it's better to start with the lower dose. And uh, secondly, the body is not used to this hormone, doesn't have it. So you make it, you in increase the dose slowly and gradually. Uh, there is stand, this is a standard care with long clinical experiences. It is aromatization to estrogen, which also promotes bone maturation. Uh, in higher doses, it can cause premature epiphyseal closure, leading to um, uh, short stature. Could inhibit the now the problem with this is that it will cause the good thing is that it will cause the uh, muscularization, but the problem is that it will not. Uh, let the testicles grow and there will not be spermatogenesis. So it can impact the future fertility. The impact on future fertility is unknown. So the gonadotropin uh, HCG can be given to these patients with 250 international units twice weekly and then increases every six months up to 1500 uh, international units three times weekly. Long and sometimes we have to add the FSH. The good thing about it is that it, 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 they respond to the growth for spermatogenesis, but this is not the standard treatment and good compliance is needed and large studies are needed for this. Uh, in cases of girls, uh, again, the same thing, what we do in girls is first we give the estrogen and uh, lower doses of the estrogen, and then we build up the dose of the estrogen followed uh, till there is good uh, breast development and there is breakthrough bleeding. So usually six months, uh, it takes usually six months. And after that, when the breakthrough bleeding takes place or full breast development occurs, then you add the progesterone. This is a standard treatment we are doing in case of the girls. Uh, now coming to fertility. So fertility, when you are going to start the treatment for fertility in these patients, so these patients as no, don't have GNRH, don't go through the same changes. So spermatogenesis or follicular genesis won't take place in them. So you need to, we need to follow some kind of treatment which follows the physiological pattern. So that's pulsatile GNRH. So we give uh, either in the in form of the 
pump. We can give tensile GnRH in form of the pump, and it the it dose adopt based and we change the dosage according to serum testosterone. But it is not available in many countries, especially in Pakistan. This is not, and it requires a lot of expertise, just like insulin pump. It requires a lot of expertise. So what we do, what we usually do, is gonadotropins. We give HCG 500 to 1500 IU subcutaneously three times weekly, and then we adjust the dose and we look at the test testosterone levels and then if this is not coming up in the spermatogenesis it's not happening we add on the FSH between 75 to 150 three times weekly. Dose is suggested on the basis of the FSH and the sperm count. The problem is the frequent injections but this is how and this is going to be done during the time period of the the required time period of the fertility. So as soon as the, the he will this will and it will take time right, to produce, start producing the sperms. And the moment he has, ha the, the, the patient completes his family, then we can stop it and then put them back on the testosterone. Now coming to the females. Okay, Isme, again, there is pulsatile GNR, GNR, so we can give the, again, the same pump, okay? Or followed by the gonadotropins. Or, or uh, which is not available. So I'm not talking about that. The gonadotropines here, we get give FSH and LH uh, subcutaneously daily, and it and we follow the follicular growth. Then for induction of follicular growth, when it grows to the proper size, we induce by giving HCG because the induction evolution for the then continue the luteal phase by giving HCG every three days for three times. And once the progesterone and the later stage of the uh, luteal phase. So uh, again, it's very expensive and it requires a lot of monitoring and it requires a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and self injection is needed. But this is how the fertility and fertility is achievable in these patients. It's not like a fertility is not achievable. These they can have live children. They have had their studies which have shown that they have live children. Uh, and because of these treatments. Okay, now if a male is come, doesn't want fertility, but he has hypogonadism, so what is the treatment? The testosterone replacement. And if the testosterone is not helping, then we can add the uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Or if the testosterone is normal, still having problem with the libido or with the, with the sexual activity, you can also give them phosphodiesterase inhibitor. In cases of females, again, you have to give the, uh, in these, who, uh, you you give the hormone replacement therapy, the uh, the cyclical therapy, the estrogen progesterone therapy, uh, in in cyclical uh, the the hormone replacement therapy which we give. Okay, so uh, here I end my uh, presentation with a thank you, and I hope I've been able to explain uh, the topic. Um, thank you, everyone. Over uh, thank to you, you doctor. Gee. Thank you, Dr. Ruj, uh, for a very comprehensive and uh, a detailed lecture. I'm sure many of the participants uh, would have uh, learned a lot from all the tiny, tiny things that you have explained today. I, I totally agree that the topic is a difficult one, and we do face challenges regarding this, uh, um, I mean, hypogonadism. Young, in, young, uh, uh, female, in young boys and girls, as well as in adults. So uh, let me now um, go through the post-lecture poll first, then I'll take comments from our professor, and uh, then we'll see about the question and answers as well. So if everyone is ready, I would again encourage all the participants. So the same questions are going to be Repeated, I have reviewed the results of the last poll. Out of five questions, at least three to five, four are correctly, I mean, opted by majority, but one of them is uh, not corrected. So I'm going to launch the post lecture poll. I hope everyone can now see the questions. Uh, Nasir Saab, if you can confirm that everyone can see the post lecture poll and I'm going to run this only for two minutes because everyone has gone through the questions. I have thoroughly uh, read them individually 
there was a issue with the question number two and four as it was not complete. So I can read that again. Question number two is a 19 year old boy who presented with a delayed puberty. His testicular volume is, uh, um, is less than four centimeter and the penile length of five centimeter. His testosterone is 3.3, LH is 2.1, FSH is 3.3. .3. Prolactin is 120 and the MRI pituitary is normal. So which of the following is the most appropriate test? And the test options are given um, in the uh, answer options. Again, I'm going to read out the question number four. A two-year-old boy was brought by his mother due to small penile size. The birth history was uneventful. He is... <clears throat> His right testes was soft and placed in the scrotum while the left was in the inguinal canal. The stretch penile length was less than one centimeter. FSH was uh, three, LH was 1.2 and testosterone was 0 0.1. So what should be done next for making any diagnosis? And the options are there. You have to opt one of them. So let me see how many participants have completed the poll, only two so far. Please, uh, make a quick uh, attempt on all the five questions so I can discuss the answers and then we will move on to the question answer format uh, session. So just one more minute for all the attendees. Please participate as quickly and uh, as quickly as you can. And also please write your questions or type your question in the question answers box. Otherwise questions can be mixed, uh, missed if you write them on the chat box. Uh, this will be a very good opportunity for all of you to have any questions because a very difficult topic very explained very nicely and easily, I think. I have actually never um, listened to a lecture on hypogonadism in such a simple form. Uh, please uh, uh, come up with your questions if you have any kind of questions. And I think 12 out of 26 participants have already um, done with the polling. So I'm now going to end the poll because we are already quite late so far. And I have, okay. So for the first question, majority of you have rightly opted for weight-related hypogonadism. Yes, this was a weight-related hypogonadism. And for the second question, uh, smell test was the right option because you have to rule out Kalman syndrome. And then for the third, uh, a woman, who, a female lady who is seeking fertility, yes, you have to stop estrogen progesterone and you should start HCG. This is the right approach. And for question number four, still many of you have uh, decided about MRI abdomen. Whereas the correct answer is HCG stimulation test, which is so nicely explained by um, uh, Dr. Rouge. I think uh, I don't have to explain it again to correct you, but MRI abdomen before, uh, this is the rule of thumb in endocrinology actually. We always uh, do stepwise first biochemical, then imaging, right? So uh, doing the biochemical test was a better idea than moving on to imaging option. Uh, I think I'm, I've re I rightly explained, Dr. Ruj, you want to add something to it? Dr. Zareen, very right, very right. right. Yes, so ACG stimulation test should be done. Ye aapko clinically help kar dega ke kis further testing karni hai. And okay, for question number five, 
मेजोरिटी ऑफ यू हैव ऑप्टेड फॉर फॉस्फो डाइस्ट्रेस ई फाइव इनिबेटर आई थिंक डॉक्टर रोज आई थिंक आप एक्सप्लेन करें कि द करेक्ट आंसर हेयर इज अरेंज कार्डियोवेस्कुलर असेसमेंट with so many uh, you know cardiovascular issues going oh, on no, i think it is actually i think when i said that ke testosterone agar normal aap de rahe hain aur phir agar nahi help ho raha to aap phosphodiesterase inhibitor de dein to us pe inhone kar diya lekin isme aap ye bhi dekhe na ke diabetes hai hypertension hai bmi hai uska dekhe so the next step should be the cardiovascular assessment in this patient before giving the biogra or pdf that will create more problems for this patient na before you go on to give phosphodiesterase you have to evaluate for the cardiovascular in this patient first so uh, this me uh, and he is having ed this means ed is means that there is ed is uh, uh, a sign of vascular uh, uh, disorder that means that atherosclerosis a sign of atherosclerosis so if it is in there this means that might be something in the heart as well it has to be evaluated first thing has to be that very rightly said and this is such a learning point that ed can be taken as a sign of cardiovascular uh, illness especially in a 60 year old male smoker with so many other things of course uh, adding a, a viagra or sildenafil is going to add more problems uh thank you so much dr ruj and with that i am now stop sharing and ending the poll so good questions actually and let's see what do we have in the question box so someone has put up uh, with a put up a question a uh, 27 year old male female presented with primary amenorrhea goiter and hypothyroidism on examination she had lack of secondary sex characteristics and diagnosed as a case of turner syndrome how we will treat her what options are available in pakistan so um would you like to answer although that the question is not related to the topic actually uh, the turner syndrome can, comes under the umbrella of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and this has already been uh, discussed in quite much detail in our lecture with dr sobia sabir uh, who had uh, done a session on amenorrhea approach um but if i mean if you feel good about answering this dr ruj so the so is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism so fertility is not possible you know, you cannot give gonadotropins to this because already they are very high in these patients so how are you going to, for amenorrhea yes we can give the hormone replacement therapy and we can give thing uh, for bone uh, for bone health health can give something for bone health like vitamin d and supplementation uh that's the treatment which will be in this case so yes the harm is more therapy okay another question is how long to wait before adding fsh to hcg in a male patient wishing for fertility uh SCG ले रहा है और उसको FSH कब ऐड करें इन अ मेल पेशेंट हु इज विशिंग फॉर फर्टिलिटी सो यू हैव टू वेट एट लीस्ट 6 मंथ्स 6 मंथ्स यू हैव टू वेट एंड सी द साइज ग्रोथ एंड द स्पर्म काउंट एंड द टेस्टोस्टेरोन लेवल्स एंड देन वी विल डिसाइड टू ऐड द एट लीस्ट 6 मंथ्स यू हैव टू वेट ओके uh so uh, someone has asked about uh, testosterone gel um what exactly do you mean about testosterone gel how to monitor complication of testosterone okay let's uh, first talk about testosterone gel i think you want to ask about whether it is available or not or whether it can be used or whether how to apply is that what you mean um this is uh, mr mohammed suleiman asalman i think if you can slightly you know clarify your I question ji dr ruj so testogels are available they are recently they have been with the oral tablets are also available the testosterone and the gel is also available it has the gel has to be applied in the places which have no less hairy areas of the skin uh, of the body and the covered areas of the body not on the genitals uh, but uh, the re results of testogels are okay uh, 
they are okay. The, the results of the inject injectables are very good, but the gels and oral tablets, the results are just okay. Not, not up to the mark, I must say. So how do you monitor complication of the testosterone? So a very good question. I actually, testosterone, when you're giving in an adult man, uh, they say it can uncover the prostatic CA. So you have to follow the PSA levels and you have to do the parietal for the prostatic size. And you also have to follow the hematocrit and the hemoglobin because testosterone raises the hemoglobin levels in these patients. Or your uh, PSA, hai, you have to follow and you have to look at the doubling time. If the doubling time is too quick, so then you have to stop and you have to evaluate for the underlying um, prostatic cancer in these patients. Um, also, uh, about how to titrate and adjust the dose of testosterone and what to monitor for testosterone level. I mean, what to monitor? That is the testosterone level, actually. But testosterone that's level, and about. clinically, we can monitor the patient. We can see hair growth, hai, beard, eye, hai, penile size. Bada hua hai, thodi masculinization ho rahi hai, nahi ho rahi hai. That's the clinical and while that mid, mid, uh, jo levels hoti hai, testosterone ke, wo dekhna hai, mid range mein hai hai ki nahi after giving the injections. That's how we follow it. Okay, uh, the same, uh, there's a question about the last question in the polling about uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, they, someone is, some, the, this is Itasham Malik actually was asking that if, Someone who has erectile dysfunction, uh, we have to treat erectile dysfunction also not on any nitrates and no previous cardiovascular event, uh, only risk factors. So would you do cardiovascular assessment in all going on phosphodiesterase inhibitors? Uh, uh, th this is, uh, it is said, it is in the guidelines and it is said that ED is a, uh, a red herring or is a is a sign of vascular soft disease, well, atherosclerotic disease. ED is a sign. So, so if a patient has, has ED and has diabetes, it is and doesn't have any history or is not on nitrates or still review for the to be it is better to review the patient for cardiovascular disorder before putting the patient on phosphodiester. Yes, I, I totally agree. And I hope that the uh, message is now completely conveyed and there is no confusion about it. It is a very important take-home message, actually, regarding erectile dysfunction today. Uh, I think with that, we can end with the question-answer session. And uh, now I will just request uh, Professor Akhtarili Baloch, sir, kindly give your uh, comments about the whole lecture and your, your review about <clears throat> it. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. Walaikum Assalam. Ji, Walaikum Assalam. Uh, so, I think, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Rouge for his uh, very nice uh, teaching session today. And especially, she took time out today on Sunday uh, from her busy schedule. Sunday is a holiday, but we are grateful to her that she decided to uh, to be with us today for his wonderful talk. And I'm sure this talk will improve our clinical practices and will help all of us and also uh, those who take the exams uh, to improve their understanding about hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and clinical features management and the, the monitoring. And I am once again thankful to her I also uh, thankful to Dr. Um, Zareen for organizing this uh, teaching session today. And uh, she is uh, <clears throat> the main person who uh, is working uh, for this course and also my faculty of uh, National Institute of Diabetes and Chronology. And I'm so grateful for uh, Brett Huston for their support and to, <clears throat> to help us to partners this course and finally i would like to request all the attendees all the participants please fill in the feedback, feedback form to improve uh, 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 this course uh, to make it more fruitable fruit, uh, fruit, uh, fruit, uh, more uh, beneficial for all of us so please uh, don't forget to fill in the feedback form 
And once again, thank you everyone, and especially Dr. Rouge for his very, for, for her wonderful talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I'm honored. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, nice comments. And of course, uh, uh, it is under your guidance and your uh, support that we are able to conduct this course. And uh, Dr. Hassan, I would like to ask you to also give your comments um, regarding today's lecture and how did it go? And um, if you are there, Dr. Hassan. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ruiz, for a very enlightening lecture. It was very nice to listen to you. Um, we have been facing this challenge every day, especially in diabetes clinic, not just the endocrine clinic, uh, facing these patients with ED and difficult uh, patients with multiple comorbidities. I think this is very important for all of us to revise and uh, rehash all these uh, knowledge, and uh, which Dr. Ruj has very nicely elaborated today. And I just uh, can say uh, that uh, thank you very much. And See you again some other time. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, again for your uh, nice comments. And uh, with that, I think we have now uh, come to the end of our session today. I encourage all the participants to kindly fill up the feedback form as Professor Akhtar has mentioned. And also, uh, there is a slight change in the uh, uh, the lecture schedule that we've discussed, uh, we have shared earlier with you. Next uh, lecture is uh, postponed to the 5th of December. Instead, we have a lecture on diabetes and obesity by Dr. Umar Khan. So see you again next week. And uh, um, before that, um, I also encourage you to um, uh, do register for the next lecture. Thank you, Dr. Rooj, for your kind and valuable you know, contribution Thank to our you. course. Uh, Thank you. We will en engage you again in our future coming uh, academic activities, which we are planning now. And uh, inshallah, we'll engage you in that. Thank you, Dwarit Sotsan, again. And thank you all. Thank you, all attendees. See you again. Allah Hafiz. Have a nice Sunday. Rest Allah of the evening. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.